the day has finally come to review not only the last Rare developed game I've yet to review, but it also just so happens to be one of my all time favourite video games. I guess I've been baking this one for a while because like my review of Super Mario 64, it's often hard to put into words just how important the game was, and is to me personally. Though as always there will naturally be a whole ton of nostalgia goggles on this one, but heck, I'm sure I'm not the only one that freaking loves this game. Developed by Rare and published by Nintendo just in time for Christmas 1997, Diddy Kong Racing was one of Rare's best kept secrets throughout 1997. So much so in fact, that if you go back and watch some of the N64 magazine time capsule episodes, you'll have seen that the press were pretty much invited to take a first look at the game to then find out that they were in fact checking out the completely finished article which would be hitting store shelves imminently. In an era when games are often announced years in advance without so much as any concept art to show off, it's a throwback to a time when, barring the odd exception, we were pretty much shown games in the press which we wouldn't have had to wait all that long to actually get to play. Development of the game started after the completion of Killer Instinct 2. The same team was split into two new teams, as was often the case at Rare in the late 90s. Whilst one team worked on Killer Instinct Gold's N64 release, the other moved on to this title. You could say, however, that the development started even before this. Originally the plan was for Rare to make a real-time strategy game based on a prehistoric theme, but that idea was eventually scrapped and they decided to ditch it and the entire RTS genre completely and move on to a more cartoon-like adventure game which too was eventually ditched. They began to dabble in creating a pro-am racing title with tricycles instead of remote control cars for some time until Rare postponed Banjo-Kazooie, the game which was scheduled to be released in time for Christmas 97. With the slot in the release schedule suddenly available and not wanting to miss on the lucrative all-important Christmas sales period, it was back to the drawing board at Rare HQ. The company needed to release a AAA title in that period and they felt that a Pro-Am title just wouldn't cut the mustard and so instead they began to rework the title into one which would have a stronger character association and more mainstream appeal. They wanted to release a game which ran as fast as Mario Kart 64 and would use their own created character Diddy Kong over Nintendo's own Donkey Kong. With just months to make the final build of the game, it may surprise you that there were only around 14 full-time staff members on the title and in fact it was one of the very reasons that Lee Musgrave has attributed to the actual fact that the game development went so well. No matter what the crazy history of the development may be, it's still incredible that in such a short space of time, one of the console's most instantly recognisable games was created. Whilst Mario Kart 64 was your straight up kart racer, Diddy Kong Racing offered something truly unique with its huge single player story mode. Timber the Tiger's parents go on holiday and leave him in charge of the island where they live. Like any Home Alone kid, he instantly invites his friends over and plans some fun play whilst the rents are away. Their prepubescent escapades are interrupted by the evil Whiz Pig, and he's a wizard pig for those a little slow on the uptake, and he plans to take over the island. Helping him are four area guardians who protect the island's four distinct worlds, and it's up to you to work your way through the races and eventually banish him back to where he came from. And that's where the adventure mode begins. After selecting one of the eight playable characters available to you at the start, you're dumped in the middle of the island and are free to begin exploring. It was this whole exploration of a fantasy and Disney-like island that I instantly loved. Whereas Mario Kart 64 saw you compete in linear fashion going from race to race and from cup to cup, DKR basically drops you off and says go see what you can find. Of course there is a little hand holding along the way. The island's genie elephant is always on hand to offer assistance where needed and there are entrances to worlds which are blocked off until you progress, by the most part you will have flexibility though to play the game how you want. And none of this would actually matter if the actual racing itself wasn't on point and thankfully it is. Sure, since Mario Kart 64 does run faster, but for me personally I much preferred the racing of Diddy Kong over Nintendo's offering. Saying something like that is divisive and they are both great games, don't get me wrong. But I personally found that the courses, all 30 of them, to be much more enjoyable to race than those in Mario Kart 64. They are generally shorter laps here, 
which give the races a much more intensive feel, but this does take away from the necessity to use power-ups during the races. Like Mario Kart 64, the game does feature an arsenal and item inventory, although here it's not as vast. Simply put, you have blue balloons to speed up, red ones are weapons, green are droppable, and the weird rainbow looking ones are magnets. Add to that the yellow and purple banded ones which act as a shield, and you have your full set. By collecting the same coloured balloons up to three times in a row, you will get an upgrade to each ability, and scattered across the courses are bananas which will slowly increase your top speed. I'll be the first to admit that the items in Mario Kart 64 are far superior, and they lead to more interesting combat. DKR however relies on more racing ability, which I personally tend to prefer over random selections which you can be cheated out of races at the last moment needlessly. And here's where things get more expanded again. Each world not only has races for you to compete in, but also a whole host of other things to do. There will also be Grand Prix races opening up, multiplayer battles and area bosses for you to go up against. I lost count of the number of hours when I was a kid that I'd be pushing hard to defeat some of the area guardians, which can be absolute nightmares the first time that you play them. After defeating them, you will then go on to the silver coin challenge races, which for many were an annoyance or filler, rather than an enjoyable element of the game. Essentially with these silver coin challenges, you're racing all over again but must collect all the silver coins on the course and win the race to pass it. These start off fairly easy in some of the well, earlier tracks, but as you progress later into the game and some of the more in-depth worlds, they do become frustratingly difficult as the positioning of said coins gets much harder to reach. Heck, it helps to flesh out the length of the game and if you enjoy a challenge like I did, then if anything it's another cool way to play the game and extend what it can offer to you. Like pretty much all rare games, this also has a whole load of collectibles. You'll be getting amulets, trophies and finding hidden keys throughout the world that you explore by land, air and sea. In perhaps one of the game's coolest features is the ability to drive a cart, fly a plane and also glide across water on a hovercraft. Many of the tracks will give you the freedom to choose which you prefer and many are actually designed to enable a mix of the three to race at the same time. It's just another example of Rare simply knowing what makes a fun game, and learning how to control and master all three vehicles is key to being able to fully complete and enjoy the entire game. If you've watched my entire playthrough of the game on the channel, you'll know that my favourite vehicles in order are cart, plane and then the hovercraft, and so I'd love to know what your favourite order of them are. Quite simply as a single player experience, DKR wipes the floor with Mario Kart 64. But that leads on to the game's biggest problem, and it's that the multiplayer gets destroyed by Mario Kart. With three other friends, nothing on the N64 comes close to taking the crown of the best kart racer with its perfectly tuned gameplay, which almost begs you to be playing it with your mates. DKR, on the other hand, offers a weak multiplayer selection of two death matches, a capture the flag type event, and one where you collect eggs. Given that the previously mentioned items in DKR are limited, it leads to multiplayer events which are fairly dull in comparison. If you head into the racetracks, this too is where DKR falls down in multiplayer. The random items in Mario Kart 64 create a frantic sense of uncertainty when racing. You could have someone brand new to the game who with the right item can turn around an entire race in a matter of seconds. With Diddy Kong Racing however, it will almost certainly always be the experienced racer who will be able to pull far away enough into the front not to have to worry about any weapons and should easily pull the victory. Don't get me wrong however, both titles really do need to be in anybody's collection. As an overall package however the game is beautiful, the bright colours, smooth textures that Rare are known for and the impeccable character design makes this amazing to look at. The characters feel alive and play differently and the worlds in which you are racing feel unique and have great themes and concepts to them. Just take Boulder Canyon as an example of a race where you go from hovering down ravines to then crossing a castle drawbridge to then working your way through tight tunnels. The design just keeps on delivering and the often multiple branching paths you can take just keeps the game feeling fresh far longer than it really should do. And add to this my favourite N64 soundtrack composed by David Wise, which is just jammed with the charm and creativity that you'd be expecting. Each world has its own area style, and the music adapts and changes accordingly. It's also dynamic, 
often changing during races depending on your environment and also the instruments you use seamlessly blend from one to another. It's no surprise therefore that the soundtrack was released on CD and you want to be looking out for the 42 track version which was released in Japan and Europe as opposed to the North American CD which only had 16 for any collectors out there. I normally wax nostalgia right at the start of my reviews but this game takes me way back to an exact moment in life. Just hearing the opening ditty takes me back to a time in life and spending countless hours playing this with my family and in my bedroom on my own just working my way through the adventure mode. And it is perhaps one of the reasons I love this game so much. I've told this story before but heck, my dad loved the game so much too that one day he even rang into my school to say I was sick just so that we could sit at home and chill playing this game on his day off. Even returning to this game in the 21st century, I'm still in awe at just how much fun this is to play. If you've never played it, then I urge you to at least give it a try. And I hope that even if you do get as much as 1% of the enjoyment out of this game I had, then you will find it to be a great game to play. In what must have been an attempt to destroy childhoods, the game had an updated remake on the Nintendo DS. But the less said about that abomination, the better. And so do yourselves a favour and don't play it. For the love of God, they even changed the genie's voice. I mean, come on, who does something like that? And so for today's topic of conversation, I'd love to know your memories of this game. Do you prefer Mario Kart 64 or Diddy Kong Racing? Do you have any cool stories like mine to share of your experience playing this? Or did you never get through the huge acclaim this got on its actual release way back in the day? I'd also love to hear from the crew that unlocked Drumstick and also most importantly, those that managed to unlock TT. It took what must have felt like weeks of my childhood, but man, what a sense of accomplishment that was to finally unlock him way back in the late 90s. Anyway, sound off in the comments section down below, and until next time.